Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Researchers at Arizona State University compared 27 vegetarian and 43 omnivore elite adult endurance athletes to determine if eating a vegetarian diet reduced strength or aerobic capacity. So the researchers looked at seven-day food journals and determined that protein intake was lower among the vegetarian athletes, but it did not make a negative difference in their lean body mass. When subjected to tests for strength and oxygen uptake, uh, the vegetarian women had a 13% higher VO2 score than the omnivores. There was no difference in strength for vegetarian women and no difference in strength or oxygen uptake for the vegetarian men. So what this really means is in some areas, the vegetarian athletes perform better and no areas were the vegetarian athletes worse off than the omnivores, which means that eating meat is not necessary. Eating more protein does not improve with athletic performance. It just increases the risk of chronic disease and uh, degenerative conditions like cancer. The researchers wrote, and I'm going to read this to you, certainly many factors affect an athlete's sports performance and there is no dietary substitute for quality training. However, our study contributes to the literature about cardiorespiratory and strength comparisons between vegetarian and omnivore endurance athletes and may provide a rationale about the adequacy of vegetarian diets for sport performance. Now, there are so many misunderstandings about protein intake and athletic performance that lead both weekend warriors, exercise enthusiasts, and professional athletes to make terrible decisions about diet. They consume too much protein, too much animal food. While proteins needed for health and function, the role of increased dietary protein and athletic performance has been incredibly over-exaggerated. Several studies have shown that strength training increases efficiency of use of protein, which means that increased dietary intake is not necessary. Research is quite clear that animal protein is not required. Athletes can take in enough from plant sources alone. Excluding animal protein from the diet does not interfere to, with improvements that lead to improved athletic performance. What athletes really do need is higher ca um, calorie intake. And as a percentage of calories, the protein doesn't change, but there is more protein intake because of higher calorie intake. In other words, the need for everything goes up, not just protein. And then, as the researchers said so beautifully, you know, no dietary substitute for quality training. My version of that is you can't build a muscular athletic body in the kitchen. You have to get into the gym. You have to work hard. That's what athletic training is all about. It's, it's training your body. Um, so diet plays a supporting role in that. Now, the good news about this is I think that there's been a perception among many that the choice is to have a stellar athletic career and, and, um, uh, and do well and eat food you shouldn't eat or eat a health-promoting diet and then you can't do as well athletically. Actually, you can do both. That's good news. I like when people don't have to make choices um, to do the right thing or the, um, or the profitable thing. You can do both. All right. On to the next thing, inflammatory bowel disease refers to several disorders of the gastrointestinal tract, the most common of which are Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. The condition involves inflammation that develops in response to irritants and eventually it becomes chronic. The symptoms are dreadful and they change people's lives in a very negative way. They include looser bloody stools, fecal urgency, diarrhea, abdominal pain and bloating, fatigue and weight loss, and it's very common for patients with this condition to have anemia and B12 deficiency. Drugs, including corticosteroids and immunosuppressant drugs, are used to treat IBD with very marginal efficacy. In fact, if you go to the Crohn's and Colitis website, one of the things they state is that um, colitis patients are a little bit luckier than Crohn's patients because you can actually cure them, air quotes around that, by taking out their colon. Uh, the Crohn's patients aren't so lucky. Again, I'll put air quotes around that. There's no such cure for Crohn's disease. And in fact, a significant percentage of colitis patients do eventually consent to the surgery to have their colon removed. About 1.4 million people in the United States have IBD, and the incidence in the United States and other westernized countries around the world is increasing, according to a new study. The authors report that the Western diet is the major cause because it negatively affects the gut microbiome, and that in turn increases the risk of IBD. Another article in the same issue of the journal in which this article I just referred to published, is published uh, reviewed and summarized a lot of recent research that looked at diet and IBD. 
Both articles stress the importance of maintaining a healthy gut microbiome as a strategy for reducing the risk of IBD, which starts with birth and feeding methods. Vaginal births and breastfeeding result in healthier microbiomes than C-section and formula feeding. Taking the antibiotics only when necessary, and they are still incredibly over-prescribed in our country. And remember, 75 or 80 percent of the antibiotics produced in our country are given to farm animals and that antibiotic residue is in the food so we're taking it in that way too so taking antibiotics only when necessary and exposure to a little dirt and grime can also be helpful and this goes to the hygiene hypothesis but there i don't really think it's a hypothesis i think it's a theory that's been proven which is that people who live in really pristine environments have an increased risk of lots of different things including ibd and autoimmune disease diet plays a major role with plant foods being protective while meat processed meat eggs sugar alcohol those things damage the microbiome Emulsifiers were mentioned in this review, specifically polysorbate 80. They damage and can destroy the mucus barrier of the colon, that's the irritant I was talking about earlier, and subsequently trigger chronic inflammation. Polysorbate 80 is an ingredient in a lot of highly processed foods. It's also used as an adjuvant in several vaccines, so we're taking in polysorbate 80 from many different sources too. A higher fiber diet that includes foods like ground flax seeds is protective, and whole foods containing omega-3 fatty acids are protective, while fish oil and omega-3 supplements are useless. The researchers state that the condition of the gut microbiome has such a profound effect on the risk for IBD that sometime in the near future, they expect that an evaluation of the microbiome will be able to predict your risk for IBD, and that treatment using diet to fix the gut microbiome will be routinely prescribed as a way to reduce the risk of IBD. I'm really looking forward to that, that uh, time. In the meantime, the best protection is a low-fat plant-based diet. Now, other studies have confirmed these findings, and in fact, in this, um, uh, in this paper, I have actually cited uh, 13 different references. Um, for example, increased, of animal, increased intake of animal protein and fat damages the gut bacteria, increases intestinal, uh, intestinal permeability, and then causes an increased risk of IBD. Um, dietary patterns that include more refined foods and protein increase the risk in adults. Meat, fat, and dessert foods increase the risk in children. Uh, for patients who already have IBD, uh, dietary change has been found to be the best treatment, particularly given the low efficacy rates for drugs. Uh, some intervention studies have shown that dietary change can significantly reduce symptoms, in some cases place patients in remission for several years. Diets high in unrefined carbohydrate reduce symptoms, days in the hospital, and surgeries. Elimination of dairy products results in reduced number of bowel movements and reduced pain. Relapse rates are higher in patients who eat more meat and protein. And some studies have shown that diet head-to-head -head with, with drugs is actually um, a better option for uh, trying to achieve remission. So diet has a profound effect on health through multiple mechanisms, one of them being the gut microbiome. We've developed a protocol here that is very good for placing people with IBD in remission. And one of the mechanisms that we've identified is the fact that it, it also addresses the problems with the gut microbiome that I've talked about in this uh, particular article. IBD is just one more disease that is a foodborne illness. Uh, it can be prevented with the right diet. And if you are unfortunate enough to have this disease, you can turn it around with the right diet in many instances. And my gosh, when you look at the side effects of some of the drugs, I think it's a much better option. All right, if you want access to these articles and the references, be a subscriber to the Health Briefs Library. Please pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next Tuesday with more news.